uh, Romans 1, uh, we read that the Apostle Paul uh, wanted to go to Rome to be a preacher. He wanted to go as a preacher. Uh, but that, the door didn't open for that to happen. Instead, he did get, go to Rome, but he went as a prisoner. And we read in Acts 27, even as he was going as a prisoner, his ship was wrecked. And it was only through the courage and the faith of Paul that prevented most of the ship's crew and the prisoners from perishing. Uh, they ended up being shipwrecked on the island of Malta, and eventually uh, Paul ended up getting to Rome, but as, uh, as a prisoner. Paul didn't have to have ideal circumstances to experience joy and peace in his life. Here we see uh, in this time period in his life, not only is he in chains, but there are Christians uh, outside the prison, uh, or in Philippi, or outside of Rome, actually, who want to make things worse for Paul. Like uh, brothers and sisters in the Lord who are preaching the gospel out of rivalry, we read here in Philippians 1, and who want to make things tougher for him. Not only does he have chains and critics, but he also ha- is in a crisis here uh, in this time period. He doesn't know when he's in jail in Rome whether he's going to be beheaded or he's going to be released. Uh, We know from uh, uh, church history that eventually from this imprisonment he was released. But this is really significant as he writes the book of Philippi. This is where he writes this letter from. He's in jail. Despite this fact, if you look in these four short chapters, 19 times... He mentions joy, rejoicing, or gladness. What was the key that enabled him to live in victory over his circumstances? You know, he doesn't have good circumstances at all here. I believe the answer to that question is found in another word that appears often in this letter. Ten times in the book of Philippi, uh, the book of Philippians, we read the word mind, and five times the word think. When we put these things together, I believe what it's saying to us is that the key for Paul in conquering his difficult circumstances was his attitude. And I believe that's the way, that's the key in our own lives as we face difficult circumstances. We've seen, uh, as we shared at the prayer time, several people have challenges. And what is the key uh, to not being overcome by those circumstances? It's our attitude. And it's our attitude and the way we think that is going to make a big difference because it's the way we think that connects us to God or disconnects us from God. Uh, Perspective is so important. And I believe that when we look at Paul's life, he had a great confidence in God's providential working in his life. Uh, Stuart Briscoe writes, Paul discovered that things happened to him in order that things should happen in him, and things happened in him so that things could happen through him. And I think that's a pretty profound statement. I've been a Christian now for about 25 years, and I really believe there's powerful truth in that statement. Things happen to us so that God can work in us, and so when he works in us, he can work through us. And a lot of times, what, the things that happen to us are not too pleasant. And uh, let me read in Philippians 1, verses 12 to 14, and just see some of the things up close, what Paul is facing. Paul writes, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord, those outside of prison, and are emboldened all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. God sometimes uses strange tools to enable us to advance the gospel. And in our passage, God uses the chains of Paul uh, to further the cause of the gospel. One of the things that Paul says here, as a result, it's become clear because of my chains that throughout the palace guard and to everyone else that I'm in prison for Christ. And 
Paul was chained to a Roman soldier 24 hours a day. And the shift changed every six hours. And these uh, Roman guards were a part of the Praetorium uh, Guard. They were the elite troops of Caesar. Uh, It's interesting, at the end of this letter in uh, Philippians 4, verse 22, when Paul is sending greetings, he he sends greetings from members of Caesar's household. Uh, The Caesar of, of the Roman Empire, there are people in his court that have been converted to Christ. And I believe that those soldiers, some of them probably were converted through having Paul next to him. You know, some people would think that he was confined and imprisoned and restricted. In fact, God, through that, those chains, those physical chains, had opened the door and set Paul free to have access to people he wouldn't have access in other, way, in, in, in other ways. And I believe that a lot of times God works like that. Like from a human perspective, from a, a natural perspective, it looks like defeat. But through the eyes of faith, a lot of times, God, through those chains, will advance the gospel. Not only did these Roman soldiers hear about the uh, the gospel and members of the royal court here in Rome, but we also see that brothers and sisters were emboldened outside of the prison because of Paul's chains to make Christ known. They They were overcoming their fear through the trials that Paul was experiencing. And we see that Paul didn't gripe or complain about his chains. Instead, he gave them or consecrated them to the Lord and asked God to use them for the furtherance of the gospel. And I really believe God answered that desire powerfully. Uh, before I, I, in other messages, I've shared about Fanny Crosby, who at six weeks of age, uh, through the negligence of her family doctor was made blind like she had a cold that had settled into her eye and the doctor uh, applied hot compress compresses and made her blind but even as a child uh, Fanny determined that the chains of darkness would not bind her into a self-pitying prison and eventually she became a mighty force for God through her hymn writing even on Sundays here the impact of Fanny's A ministry is experience. She is a blessing for God even now, even though she's been dead for many, many generations, many generations. Paul's chains not only gave him contact uh, uh, with these uh, soldiers and emboldened people, but what also happened, though, is that it inspired some critics to take advantage of his vulnerability. Like in verses 15 to 18 of Philippians 1, it, it says, It is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. The latter do so out of love, knowing that I'm put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing that they can stir up trouble for me while I'm in chains. But what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached And because of this, I rejoice. Just think of the attitude that Paul has. Like it's one thing to someone to say to you, well, you need to trust the Lord. And you need to yield yourself to the Lord to experience his peace and his contentment. And if you're going through a trial or tribulation, you say, well, if you were in my shoes, you would find it a little more harder than that. But Paul does have it hard here. Not not only is he in chains, not only is he in a crisis, a life and death crisis, he doesn't know whether he's going to be beheaded or not, but so-called brothers and sisters who who are supposed to come to his aid are taking advantage of the situation, wanting to make it worse for him. But despite this, Paul maintains a good attitude. And I believe the, the, the key, the reason why he's able to do so is in verse 21, And verse 22 of Philippians 1, it's his single-minded focus on Christ. Let, Let me read this. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? 
I do not know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it's much more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and joy in the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. What made the difference for Paul that he was able to be an overcomer from these difficult circumstances and trials? It was his single-minded focus or attitude on Christ. And it's the same in our own situations. Like if, if, our, if we have a single-minded focus uh, to want to please the Lord, and if we've grown in that relationship with him, we are going to be able to see the, the circumstances in our life from a divine perspective. Uh, last week I had the, me- the message on David and Goliath. And we saw that the Israel army and King Saul, when Goliath, the nine f- over nine foot giant, came out to, to uh, challenge the Israel army, the only thing they could see was Goliath. Goliath was like God to them. But when David, who was just a teenage boy, came out and faced Goliath, he, he saw, he, he didn't deny the ugly reality. You know, when God gives difficult circumstances in our lives, he doesn't want us to pretend that they're not there. We do need to face the giants in front of us. And we saw that David faced that giant in its ugliness in, 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 in the bigness of the, of, of, the, of the problem that was before him. But the difference for David was he also saw God behind Goliath. And he knew that Goliath was not God. And when we go through difficult circumstances and when we face problems, God wants us to face our problems head on, but he doesn't want us to look at those problems as if they're God. He wants us to see uh, those as opportunities to look to him to see how he can work. Here it says that, you know, Paul says, I'm in chains. And uh, uh, in verse 12 of chapter 1, he says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel. And then in verse 25, he says, I think God, I'd rather be with Jesus. I, I, I don't mind getting beheaded. For Christ, because I'm going to be with the Lord, which is better. But I think God, Christ wants me to be with you for the furtherance or the advance of your faith and joy in Christ. Not only is he single minded, but he's servant minded. He has a servant attitude. Like, attitude is key in our lives, but it's not in of ourselves. You know, what I'm advocating here is not a shallow uh, pop psychology, self help kind of uh, uh, way we should approach our problems. That's not going to cause us to have victory over those problems and circumstances. You know, certain things happen in our lives that are way stronger than our, us. Circumstances way stronger than us. Here, he's facing death. But through, he knows through Christ, even though death is certain for all of us, and it will be one day for Paul, and it might be sooner or later, he knows that Christ has defeated death. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And so he's not uh, resigned himself that he is going to die. He doesn't want to die. But because of his faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ, he knows that even death, uh, Christ has even overcome death. And he doesn't have to worry about it. And he thinks that God is going to deliver him here in prison in Rome, just like he delivered him years before in Acts 16 when the Philippian church was planted, when he was severely flogged with Silas, and, and, and they were put in stocks in the inner cell. It's interesting how Acts 16 puts it. It shows how uh, uh, restricted he was. And from a human perspective, it seemed like no hope for Paul and Silas. But as they prayed and sang hymns to God, God delivered them. And you know, some people who are skeptics, who don't have faith in Christ or the gospel, think, well, that, that's just the early church wrote that. That didn't really happen. Well, the Phil- Philippian church is right here in history. He's writing to it years later. Church records show that he was in prison in Rome. And eventually, he was released here. But he was imprisoned again in Rome. And with Peter, they were beheaded. Paul 
and, and, and Peter for the gospel. And actually, all of those original 11 apostles, besides Judas Iscariot, 10 of the 11 were martyred for Christ. And only the apostle John lived to an old age, but even he spent uh, time, many years, on the island of Patmos, uh, uh, cracking rocks and, and, and in slave labor. But we see that that Paul, 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 Paul's attitude, is his mind is single-minded to please the Lord. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. And he has a servant's mind. And he says that if I'm alive, that's going to mean uh, that I'm going to be here for the progress of your joy and faith. And that word uh, uh, advance or progress in the Greek, is a Greek military term referring to army engineers who go before the troops to open the way into a new territory. And uh, instead of finding himself restricted as a prisoner, Paul discovered that his circumstances really opened new areas of ministry. And uh, Warren Wearsby writes that sometimes God has to put chains on his people to get them to accomplish a pioneer advance that could not happen in any other way. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes a young mom may feel uh, chained to the home as she, as she cares for her children. But you know what? God can use that so-called chain to further the cause of the gospel. Uh, Susanna Wesley was the mother of 19 children before days of labor-saving devices and disposable diapers. Out of that large family came John and Charles Wesley whose combined ministry shook the British Isles. Like Susanna Wesley discipled her kids, taught them about Jesus, taught them about God. And those children went on to make a difference for the kingdom of God, especially uh, Charles Wesley and John Wesley's ministry. Like our denomination finds its roots in Wesleyan theology. And uh, we sing Charles Wesley's hymns at different times. So we see that God sometimes uses strange tools to advance the cause of the gospel. And the, the key to Paul using difficult circumstances for the advance of the gospel was his single-minded, servant-minded attitude. And then the final point I want to make here is the greatest gift Christians can give to this world is to let Christ be magnified in our lives and in our bodies. Like in verse 20, it says... Paul says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted or magnified in my body, whether by life or by day, death. Warren Wiersbe asks the question, does Christ need to be magnified? After all, how can a mere human being ever magnify the Son of God? Well, we need to remember that stars are much bigger than a telescope. And yet the telescope magnifies the stars and brings them closer. The believer's body and life is to be like a telescope that brings Jesus Christ close to people. To many people in our culture, Jesus is just some foggy, misty figure uh, in the history of mankind who lived centuries ago. How can Jesus who's distant to a lot of people, be made close to people you rub shoulders with who, have, who don't know, hardly know anything about Jesus. Well, it's how we handle uh, less than ideal circumstances. And uh, as we are single-minded and servant-minded, uh, you know, a lot of times as Christians, we could think, well, yeah, you know, like it's so easy as a Christian to get cynical. I've been a Christian now 27 years, and it's even as a pastor, it's so easy to get cynical. But we have to battle that kind of attitude and know that when we do go through trials and tribulations, we don't face it alone. Jesus is there. He has a purpose. He has a purpose. Like I, I'm a bivocational pastor. And I work at another job, uh, about 22 hours a week, many times maybe 27 hours. And you could, I could, as a pastor, see those as chains and, 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 and get um, in a self-pitting party and say, God, why do I have to go work at that other place? 
at the Essex County Association for Community Living. You've called me to be a pastor. But you know what? God has given many opportunities in that place to make Christ known. I've got to know the other workers very well over, over the years. And our house doesn't have a lot of turnover like a lot of other houses have within our association. And it's, it's interesting when people go through trials and tribulations and how open people are to Jesus. Or even when I make a mistake. You know, I make sometimes a mistake there, like uh, with meds. And your attitude in dealing with those mistakes and owning up to it and not making excuses <laughs> and, and, and how you, you can make even Christ known through a mistake you make. And the thing is, I don't look at it as a chain, but as an opportunity. And I've, uh, Colleen and I have talked many times that I don't want that to lose that job until they, they tell me I have to go at 65 because there are just too many opportunities to make Christ known and to magnify Christ. There's a lot of people who don't know anything about Jesus there. And the only Jesus they can see is, is through our body and lives. And so we are like telescopes. And you know what? We're also like microscopes. What does a microscope do? It makes a tiny thing big. To a lot of people, Jesus is not very big. He's tiny. There are far more important things in people and many people's lives in our culture here today. And I know you've noticed that. You don't have to let, uh, have me tell you that. But you know what happens? As we trust Christ with a single-minded focus and with a servant-minded focus, that tiny Jesus, people could see how big he really is and how he does make a difference in our lives. How he makes a difference at a funeral. That even though we shed tears and we grieve, we know that's not the final answer. That's not the final chapter in that person's life. But that Christ has defeated death. I want to ask you here this morning, what are you alive to? We know that Jesus was alive to Christ. And whatever we are alive to, that's what our life really is. Like when I pass a jewelry store, I, I pass by an indifference. I hardly ever no, I notice it, I think, at, at the mall. But you know what? When I pass a bookstore, I always notice that it's a bookstore there, a used bookstore or chapters or whatever. I know that's a bookstore because I love books and I love to read. And so we are, real life consists of what we are really alive to. And for Paul, he was really alive to Christ. That was a part of his relationship. And uh, I think I want to close with a test. I think we, uh, we could take a test from verse 21. You know, for to live is blank and to die is blank. Fill in the blanks yourself or I'll, I'll help you for a, for a few. For example, for to me to live is money and to die is what? To leave it all behind. For to me to live is fame, and to die is to be forgotten. For to me to live is power, and to die is to lose it. If we want to experience joy and peace despite less than ideal circumstances, and if we want to be used by God at, in a pioneer advancing of the gospel, what needs to be true in our lives is for me to live is Christ. And to die is gain. This is the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.